Hello, everybody, and welcome to Headache and Pain session for the Brain Conference. It is my pleasure today to co-chair this session together with uh, Roberto De Ico from Italy. My name is Masur Ashina. I'm a professor of neurology at the Danish Headache Center, University of Copenhagen. We have a uh, very interesting uh, three lectures today, and uh, we also have two data bleeds presentations by uh, young scientists. So it's going to be a very interesting program, and you have also possibility to ask the questions via chat. Now we'll pass to Roberto. So, Roberto, please. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Roberto De Ico. I work in Pavia, Mondino Foundation, University of Pavia. It is a pleasure to co chair this wonderful session on uh, headache and pain. It is a topic that always attracted my interest. Uh, migraine is a very important neurological disease as primary headaches in general. They are, they are highly prevalent and disabling and they affect uh, the most productive years of patient's life. And uh, this is a great session with uh, renewed speakers of uh, uh, international expertise and young researchers. So I think we can uh, start with the first uh, presentation. So it's the teaching talk. It, the first speaker is Professor Mesuda Shina. She he is a professor uh, at the University of Copenhagen, the chief of the Danish Headache Center, uh, Renews uh, Center for Migrant Research in uh, Glostrup, Copenhagen. He will talk on uh, human uh, provocation models and uh, how these tools uh, were able to provide solid data for uh, novel targets, uh, therapeutic targets in migrant. So please, I look forward to hearing his presentation. Hello, my name is Mesur Ashina. I'm professor of neurology at the Danish Headache Center, University of Copenhagen. Today, I'm going to present you Human Provocation Models, a guide to drug discovery in migraine. I will describe the development and use of these models in the discovery of key molecular pathways and the identification of biomarkers and drug targets. Here are my disclosures. And I start with a very simple question. What makes migraine unique? Well, migraine is a common neurological disorder that afflicts 10% of the global adult population. Despite breakthroughs in our understanding of the pathogenesis of migraine and the development in the treatment options, considerable gaps remain in our knowledge of the signaling pathways involved and specific biomarkers of migraine are lacking. Much scientific progress in headache medicine results from translational research. Animal research is important for understanding the basic biology involved in migraine, such as trigeminal vascular system, cortical spreading depression, nociception at the peripheral and central levels, immunohistochemical localization of neuropeptides and neuropeptide receptors. However, migraine is a unique human experience, so human research is essential for identifying specific research goals for the basic scientists. And what is important is that the key feature of migraine is that the various triggers can initiate migraine attacks. Here I show you the most common triggers reported by patients. Menstrual cycle, sleep deprivation, sometimes too much sleep, weather changes, alcohol, pharmacological triggers, well-known uh, pharmacological trigger nitroglycerin. Well, this unique feature of migraine provides us unique opportunity to explore signaling pathways by experimentally inducing migraines. And because migraine is treatable, it is possible to do it in the lab conditions. And we can also identify changes that occur in the brain during the lead up to an migraine attack. Let's have a look at the migraine anatomy and physiology. Well, trigeminal vascular system is anatomical and physiological substrate of migraine. 
Nociceptive transmission originates from activation and synthetization of the first order trigeminovascular neurons. Their cell bodies are in trigeminal ganglion, and their afferent fibers innervate the meninges and its vessels. Ascending nociceptive transmission from the trigeminal ganglion is projected to brainstem, activating and synthesizing second order trigeminovascular neurons, including those in the spinal trigeminal nucleus. This in turn activates and synthesizes third order trigeminal vascular neurons in the thalamus, which subsequently relay the nociceptive transmission to the somatosensory cortex and other cortical areas, ultimately resulting in the perception of migraine pain. And we also know from preclinical studies that activation of the trigeminovascular system associated with the release of the various mediators, including neuropeptides such as CGRP, calcitonin generated peptide, nitric oxide, pituitary adenylate cyclase polypeptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide. Triggering migraine. Migraine provocation studies should preferably be double-blind crossover studies, and they typically involve random assignment of participants to receive intravenous infusion or oral drug of either the putative trigger factor or a placebo. Then, data of headache occurrence are captured in headache diary. Headache scores are filled in Dune during the infusion and hourly after discharge. All characteristics of headache and its accompanying symptoms are recorded in the diaries. Studies can also be tailored to examine specific hypotheses. For instance, if the focus of the study is to identify imaging or, or biochemical markers of migraine, scans and blood samples are collected at baseline, at predefined intervals during the study, when effects are expected, and at the conclusion of the experiment. So here one example, when we infuse the CGRP of PACAP during the 20, 20 minutes of infusion, we can record headache uh, characteristics, and then we can wait for the onset of uh, migraine attack, and it's usually at onset of headache, uh, followed by the onset of migraine, then the migraine culminates with its intensity and associated symptoms, then end of the migraine and end of the headache. So you have a almost 100% control situation when you can study, explore complex migraine mechanisms in vivo in humans. Exploring signaling pathways in migraine. So let me start with the CGRP, calcitonin generated peptide, which is a widely distributed in the peripheral and the central nervous system. We know from experimental studies that the CGRP induces migraine attacks in patients with and without aura in about 72% of the patients, and about 30% of the patients do not report attacks. CGRP now is a well-established key component of migraine pathogenesis. However, as I mentioned before, CGRP infusion only induces migraine attacks in approximately 70% of the patients. And what is interesting is anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies reduce monthly migraine days in approximately 60% of the patients. This suggests heterogeneity in migraine induction and treatment response. Therefore, in-depth study of CGRP-related peptides and their receptors are warranted to identify new therapeutics for migraine treatment. And in this context, we see the calcitonin family as a group of peptide hormones that share structural similarities with calcitonin, and they include not only CGRP, but also amylene and adrenomidulin. 
Adrenomethylene and CGRP, they share stru structural homology, and both peptides belong to the same superfamily. Amylin is more interesting because amylin receptor expression in sensory neurons and rodent status reporting's effect of amylin in pain models, and also the amylin analog causing headache as a side effect. All these studies suggest that amylene and its receptors could also play an unrecognized role in migraine. And further connection between amylene and CGRP is their shared receptor amylene 1. Here I'd like to present you a study that we published last year. Uh, and in this study, we selected promelintide as an amylene agonist because human amylene is not suitable uh, for use as a drug in humans. So we conducted a randomized, double-blind, two-way crossover positive control clinical study. In this study, patients received CGRP or amylene in random order. Infusion time, 20 minutes and the in-hospital period about two hours when the headache questionnaire collected all the data on headache characteristics, including migraine features, then vital signs every 10 minutes uh, up to two hours. Then the patients were discharged from the hospital and uh, they were provided with a headache questionnaire, a diary, where they collected all the headache characteristics for the next 12 hours. Here are our main findings on headache intensity, migraine incidence, and plasma levels. On the left, you see responses after amylene. The red line is a median headache intensity, and the black lines are individual pain responses. Migraine incidence. 41% of the patients reported migraine attacks after infusion of amylene. Median time to onset of migraine attacks, two and a half hours. In the middle, you see responses after the CGRP. 56% of the patients reported migraine attacks after infusion of CGRP. Median time to onset of attacks, about three hours. Substantial number of patients reported attacks after amylene and after CGRP. And the question was whether the amylene attacks are CGRP receptor or CGRP mediated. Well, in this study, we also included a series of pharmacological and behavioral uh, animal studies. And those studies showed that this effect is unlikely CGRP dependent. On the right, you see our plasma levels uh, data showing that infusion with pramlamtide induces increase of the amylene concentration and no change in CGRP, and infusion of the CGRP causes increase of the CGRP concentration and no changes in amylene, again suggesting that effect of amylene is independent from CGRP. So our findings propose amylene receptor agonism as a novel contributor to migraine pathogenesis. And greater therapeutic gains could be therefore made for migraine uh, patients if we provide a dual amylene and CGRP receptor agonism rather than selectively targeting the canonical CGRP receptor. The next status I'd like to show you are on PACAP and VIP. Pituitary adenylate cyclase activating polypeptide PACAP and vasa active intestinal peptide VIP. All these peptides are the member of the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide glucagon gross hormone releasing factor secreting superfamily. They act on the same receptors and the effect, the vascular effect, are mediated by the upregulation of the cyclic AP. PACAP in human body exists in two isoforms, PACAP38 and PACAP27.
This was one of the first studies when we compared PACAP38 directly to the VIP in the same patients. So this was a crossover study. This study showed that the, there is a huge difference between the PACAP38 and VIP. The difference is in the migraine induction rates. You see 73% of the patients reported migraine attacks after the PACAP38 and only 18% after VIP. We asked the question, maybe there is a difference in terms of the median time from infusion start to onset of migraine attacks. But here we found no difference. But this study also included MRI angiography when we collected data on the vascular responses. Now pay attention. On the right, you see MRI and geography data when we collected specific segments in the different arteries, the circumference changes after the infusion of PACAP38 and VIP. The green superficial temporal artery, the blue middle meningeal artery, and the red middle cerebral artery. You see the difference between these peptides is that duration of the vascular responses, long lasting after PACAP38 and short lasting after VIP, in spite of the infusion time was the same. But the similarities that none of these peptides induces dilation of the middle cerebral artery. And if we can use this lack of dilation as a proxy for the blood-brain barrier, we can state that those peptides are unlikely to cross blood-brain barrier, so they exert their action in the periphery. When we have a receptor similarities between the PACAP and the VIP, we ask the question, is it anything from the receptor profile that can explain the differences in migraine induction besides of the vascular responses? Well, we know from the preclinical studies that PACAP38 has a thousand times higher affinity for the PAC1 receptor than the VIP. Could it be a drug target? So based on this data, we ask the question, can we block PACAP or its receptors in migraine. One of the first studies assessed the safety and efficacy of AMG301, an inhibitor of the PAC1 receptor for prevention of migraine. So in this in double blind uh, trial, patients were randomized to placebo or two different doses and two regimens of anti-PACA monoclonal, PAC1 receptor monoclonal antibody. There was also a safety follow-up period after the study completion. So here we have our main data showing that the change from baseline in monthly migraine days for each of the AMG301 dose groups was not different from placebo. So this trial failed. And the question is whether the antibody was not potent enough or whether the PAC1 receptor is not relevant in terms of the uh, migraine pathophysiology and also cannot explain the migraine induction after the PACAP. Well, can we block PACAP in migraine? The good news is that we have a monoclonal antibodies designed to target PACAP, meaning anti-ligand, so they are in the early stage of development and very soon in a year and a half probably we will see some data either showing the effect of pack up in migraine prevention or showing no effect of these medications now i'd like to talk about targeting downstream signaling pathways and why it's important so drugs that, that block degradation of cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP intracellular uh, molecules, they induce migraine attacks in much higher induction rate, more than 80%. The observation that the nitric oxide donor GTN glycerol trinitrate causes migraine attacks 
via intracellular cyclic GMP and the CGRPN pac 38 by increased intracellular cyclic AMP, this has led to the speculations that these are unifying neurochemical mechanisms inciting migraine. These findings have led to the hypothesis that the modulation of nociceptive transmission by ion channels, mainly potassium channels, may be a common pathway in the genesis of a migraine attack. So now about the rationale targeting of the ATP sensitive potassium channel and large conductance calcium activated potassium channels, what we call big channels in migraine. What is the rationale? Well, both channels are expressed in migraine related structures such as the cranial arteries, trigeminal ganglion, and trigeminal spinal nucleus. Both channels are also activated by several key molecules in migraine pathogenesis, such as nitric oxide, CGRP, PACAP38, and phosphodiesterase inhibitors, silastazole, and sildenafil. We also know that the synthetic KTP and big channel openers provoke headache. Here I show you data on leuchromacalim, which is a KTP channel opener. As you can see, leuchromacalim induced migraine attacks in all patients with migraine. And median time to onset for migraine-like attacks was about three hours after start of infusion, 20 minutes infusion. On the right, you see responses after placebo, and at the far right, you see the migraine attacks induced by leuchromacalim in terms of the localization and in comparison spontaneous migraine attacks and according to patients all attacks mimic their usual spontaneous migraine attacks so this was the first study showing that levochromacalim can induce migraine attacks the second study we examine the big channel opener maxipost in migraine experimental study and we show that the maxipost induces migraine attacks in more than 95% of the patients. And here again, the median time to onset of migraine attacks, about three hours. And the right, you see the placebo responses. Based on our data uh, from uh, experimental models using a KTP channel and big channel opener and migraine induction, we proposed trigeminal vascular ion channel hypothesis of migraine pathogenesis. If you look at the first box, you see that the various signaling molecules, including nitric oxide, CGRP, PACAP, initiate a cascade of intracellular processes that result in opening of the ATP sensitive potassium channels on vascular smooth muscle cells within the intracranial arteries. In the second box, you see that efflux of potassium causes hypopolarization and vasodilation of these arteries. Then in the third box, you see increased intra intracellular potassium provides the requisite electrochemical gradient to synthesize and discharge perivascular trigeminal primary efferents in the walls of the intracranial arteries. Then in the fourth box, you see that the nociceptive impulses are transmitted to and processed by cortical and subcortical regions via sending trigeminal pa pain pathways, ultimately resulting in the perception of migraine pain. Here is important to uh, uh, underline that elevation in extracellular levels of positively charged ions, not potassium exclusively, maybe the principal drivers which are needed to activate and sensitize trigeminal primary afferents in the walls of the intracranial arteries. In conclusion, opening of the KTP channels causes migraine attacks with and without aura. Opening of the big channels causes migraine attacks without aura. An opening of these channels is the strongest provocation of migraine ever studied. And finally, we suggest 
that the blocking of these channels as a new therapeutic target downstream from the signaling molecules. Because of the distribution of the KTP channels in the very important structures, it is important to find some selective KTP channels that we can target for future migraine prevention. And in this context, based on the preclinical studies, we suggest that the SUR2B subunit and the QR61 subunit should be a potential target for the treatment of migraine because of their localization in the smooth muscle cells, pre uh, uh, preferentially in the cranial vessels. And that's why we think that could be an interesting target. So the key point of my presentation today is that all signaling molecules involved in the genesis of a migraine attacks are potent vasodilators. Modulation of the nociceptive transmission by ion channels, mainly potassium channels, may be a final common pathway in the genesis of a migraine attack. And insights from the human models of migraine and supportive preclinical data have also provided a basis for the development of targeted therapies. However, not all have proven effective for the treatment of migraine, and some provide only modest therapeutic benefits, which underscore the complexity of migraine. Finally, I'd like to thank funding, participants, my colleagues, and finally, I'd like to invite all participants to this uh, virtual event, International Conference Advances in Migraine Sciences, March 10 to 12 in Copenhagen. And uh, for all international participants, it's, uh, it's online and registration is completely free of charge. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Ashina, for your uh, nice presentation. I'm uh, always impressed by the quality and the body of data provided by the Danish EDEC Center. I think uh, these novel targets will be the future for uh, migrant research. Uh, we do not have uh, live questions in the chat. It is uh, an opportunity to uh, remind to the audience uh, to provide the, and to ask questions using the chat function for the next presentation. Mm -hmm. I think we can move on for the first data blitz. We stay in Copenhagen right now. The first data blitz is presented by Dr. Kokoti. He's a PhD student at the Denegad Center in Copenhagen. And uh, she will talk about the effects on uh, glibenkamide on packup induced uh, uh, clinical and hemodynamic effects in healthy controls. Hello, so I am Lili Kukuti and I'm a PhD fellow at the Danish Headache Center and today I will give you a short overview of the study we conducted in our lab in Copenhagen where we explored the effect of clibenclamide on PACAP38 induced headache and vascular changes. So PACAP38 is a vasoactive peptide that is released from trigeminal and parasympathetic perivascular nerve fibers and we know that intravenous infusion of PACAP38 leads to prolonged dilation of extracerebral arteries that is accompanied by headache in healthy participants and migraine attacks in migraine patients. Preclinical studies indicate that in vascular smooth muscle cells, PACAP38 triggers intracellular cascades, as we see here, leading to activation of several downstream molecules, including the ATP-sensitive potassium channels. KTP channels open and there is a potassium efflux from the cell, hyperpolarization and vasorelaxation. Now, glipinclamide is a non-specific KTP channel blocker and widely used anti-diabetic medication. We aimed to block the PACAP38 induced responses by targeting downstream the KTP channels with glipinclamide. To test our hypothesis, we conducted a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled and crossover study in healthy volunteers. All participants would arrive at the clinic on two different study days and they were randomly assigned to receive PACAP38 followed by glibenclamide on one day 
and PACAP38 followed by placebo on the other day. We used throughout the provocation experiment a validated headache questionnaire to map the occurrence of headache and any associated symptoms, and we used transcranial Doppler to measure the velocity of the middle cerebral artery and ultrasound skin imaging systems to measure the diameter of the superficial temporal artery. After four and a half hours, the participants were discharged and kept a headache diary at home until 12 hours post pack up infusion. Here we see the individual headache ratings using a numerical scale where zero is no pain at all and 10 is the worst imaginable pain. And we see the thicker line that represents the median score. And we saw that the incidence and the area under the curve did not differ significantly between the two study arms. For the vascular parameters, on both study days, we can see that PACAP38 led to a significant dilation of the superficial temporal artery on the left and a decrease in the velocity of the middle cerebral artery. However, there was no significant differences over time between the PACAP38 glibenclamide day and the PACAP38 and placebo day. To conclude, we are in need of more specific KTP channel blockers to investigate the PACAP38 signaling pathway more efficiently. Thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you for our nice presentation. Uh, just one question for you. Uh, the effects you show of a glibenclamide were on uh, healthy controls, but we know that the pathophysiology of the trigeminal vascular system is different in migraine patients, uh, and uh, PACAP38 induced migraine in migraine patients, but not in healthy controls. Do you think that uh, glibenclamide would induce different effects in migraine patients if tested in migraine patients? Uh, thank you. Uh, for this interesting question. So, um, firstly, we would exp we know that all migraine provoking molecules that lead to prolonged vasodilation, they might lead to migraine attacks in migraine patients and just headache in healthy controls. However, in both groups, we have the same pronounced physiological effect of vasodilation. So, if we want to block this vasodilation and subsequently the headache or migraine, we would expect that also in healthy volunteers, there would be an effect on this vasodilation, which there wasn't. And uh, for migraine patients then, the other problem is that in the current formulation that we have glibenclamide available, so oral formulation of pills that uh, are not uh, as powerful as an IV formulation that we would like in order to explore in migraine patients, we think that with the current form, it wouldn't be different in migraine patients. Thank you so much. Another question by Professor Ashina. Can you speculate on your data showing that regardless of the drug you use to trigger a migraine, all migraines begin with a delay of two, three hours. So it's a delay headache. That's a very good question. I think that the, the, the migraine induction all depends on the threshold. And, and the threshold, uh, we might speculate uh, when I say threshold, where? At the central level or the peripheral level. It could easily be at the peripheral level. The threshold is specific because when we induce migraine attacks, we show that two, three hours, the median time to onset. There is a number of patients who develop migraine attacks already 30 minutes after start of the infusion. 40 minutes after start of infusion. So it's quite a heterogeneous group of patients, but of course, 50% of them develop uh, a very, uh, you know, about two hours. Interestingly, in comparison, if you take a cluster headache patients, in the cluster headache attacks are provoked within the one hour, you know, within the one hour that the more, most of the patients will develop the attack. So I think it's something to do with the, the, the nociceptor thresholds that the differences between the migraine and cluster headache. It's just speculation, no data. Thank you. Just the last question. Which KTP channel would be more specific for migraine? Lily. Thank you for this question. Um, so we believe that uh, the KTP channels that are more profoundly expressed in the vascular smooth muscle cells are the one that we are interested in for migraine, which is the 
here 61 sur to b subtype and glibenclamide is a non-specific uh, KTP channel blocker and actually is a currently used anti-diabetic medication which targets more potently the KTP subunit that's expressed in the beta pancreatic cells and not that potently the ones in the vascular smooth muscle cells. So we would like a specific channel blocker for these KTP channels. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation and for the Q&A. Thank you for being with us. I think we can move to the next talk. That is a basic science research talk held by Professor Rami Burstein. He is a professor of anesthesia and neuroscience at Harvard Medical School. His uh, works uh, provided uh, uh, a major body of data about central and peripheral sensitization in migraine. And uh, today is going to talk uh, on the possible sites of action of novel monoclonal antibodies against uh, CCRP. Please. My name is Ami Boston, and the topic of my talk is monoclonal antibodies against CGRP, and really what they teach us about migraine pathophysiology, given that we learn so much about the uh, possible sites of action and mechanism of action in migraine prevention. Unlike in the field of pain, in the field of headache, one of the notions that dominated the field was that the headache phase of migraine is generated inside the brain rather than in peripheral pain chambers. What it says is that no input from peripheral nociceptors is required for the initiation or maintenance of what patients perceive as pain in the head. If this, were, if this were the case, however, drugs that are too large to cross the blood-brain barrier should not be able to terminate and or prevent the headache as they cannot reach the neurons in the brain that generate the migraine or the headache. Why can't they reach the brain? Here it is. On the, on the upper right, you see the size of fermanesumab. CGRP monoclonal antibodies relative to the size of the blood brain barrier and relative to the size of caffeine, which is 194 delta. If you look at it more globally, on the left you see the relative size of glucose, caffeine, aspirin, cocaine, cannabis, and Prozac, all drugs that, readily, that easily cross the blood brain barrier. Look at their size relative to the size of CGRP monoclonal antibodies on the right, 150,000 Dalton. How can a drug, a molecule that large, cross the blood brain barrier? Furthermore, if we, if we tag fermanesumab, one of the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, with a fluorescent uh, molecule like the Alexaflow 594, and we inject it intravenously and then wait several hours or several days, what we see is that in the dura, within hours, and then of course within days, the fermanesumab leak from the blood vessels into the dura itself, whereas in the PIA, it does not. We see it in fixed tissue days later, and we see it in live tissue using, using a multi-photon microscope within several hours. We see leakage from the blood vessel to the dura, we don't see any leakage from the blood vessel to the PR. Remember, PR is inside the blood brain barrier, dura is outside the blood brain barrier. Where else do we see fermanesumab when we inject it intravenously? We see it in the trigeminal ganglion, in the, around the, the sensory neurons and trigeminal ganglion. We see it around the sensory neurons in the C2 dorsal ganglion, both sensory neuron. We see it around neurons in the parasympathetic sphenopalatine ganglion. We do not see it in hypothalamus. We do not see it in the thalamus. We do not see it in the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Interestingly, we don't see it in the hypothalamus where the blood brain barrier is relatively compromised, even when we increase the brightness 200% in order to figure to see even a little bit of it. So what is it then that CGRP monoclonal antibodies teach us about migraine pathophysiology? Can CGRP monoclonal antibodies prevent activation of peripheral trigeminal vascular neuron by CSD? They have to do that 
if we think that they act centrally. So we record from two classes of peripheral trigeminal vascular neurons, from the A-delta fibers and from the C-fibers, as shown in this slide in the, on top in the absence of any treatment, corticospreading depression, produce prolonged activation of peripheral nociceptor meningeal nociceptors. In animal treated with CGRP monoclonal antibodies, CGRP monoclonal antibodies appear to prevent activation of the A-delta fibers on the left, but not the activation of the C-fibers on the right. Can CGRP monoclonal antibodies prevent activation of central to germinal vascular neurons by CST? The answer is yes and no. Anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies prevent activation of high threshold, but not WDR to germinal vascular neurons. Just to remind you, WDR neurons are found mostly in lamina 5, a little bit in lamina 1. High threshold neurons are found mostly in lamina 1, a little bit in lamina 5. But clearly, the effect of the monoclonal antibodies is in sharp contrast between the WDR and high threshold neurons. Anatomy shows us that, anatomy that comes mostly from Lars Edvinson group, shows us that CGOP, the peptide, is found mainly in the C fibers, but not in the A delta fibers, and in contrast, it is the A delta fibers that express the CLR ramp one the CGRP receptors, but not the CGRP peptide. So how do we put it all together in the following way? We propose that there are two parallel pathways for the initiation of headache by cortical spreading depression. There is a red, there is a red pathway that, that consists of the unmyelinated C fibers and the W in the periphery and the WDR known centrally and there is a CGRP dependent pathway consisting of the blue neurons that you see here which are the thinly myelinated A delta fibers in the periphery and the high threshold neurons in the spinal trigeminal nucleus. CGRP is not required for the activation of the C fibers. Well, number one, they don't have the receptors. Number two, it appears that the activation require other receptors. When C fibers get activated, nevertheless, they release CGRP. The CGRP diffuses from the C fibers to the A delta fibers and activate the A delta fibers through their CGRP receptors. And it is the A delta fibers that activate the hydrogen neurons when CGRP monoclonal antibodies appear in the meninges and neutralize the CGRP receptors, they block the ability of CGRP to activate the A-delta fibers. When the A-delta fibers do not get active, they cannot activate the high threshold neurons. It is this scenario that explains to us why CGRP monoclonal antibodies prevent activation of the blue pathways, but not the red path pathway. It also, this model predicts that activation of C fibers precedes activation of A delta fibers. It was more than 10 years ago that we had this finding in A delta in the C fibers that usually get activated with a delay of many, many minutes after the occurrence of aura. At the time, we proposed that it is the immediate activation of the C fiber and the WDR that can explain the spontaneous onset of aura and headache, and it is the A delta and high threshold neurons that can explain the delayed onset of headache after aura. What we are proposing now is that it is the activation of the C fibers that activate the A delta fibers and the A delta fibers that activate the high threshold neurons. How do we interpret it? as follow. Since migraine can be prevented by drugs that act outside the brain, it is reasonable to conclude that the principal driver of the headache phase of migraine is the meningeal nociceptor. 
The heading phase of Mangan is not generated in the PG or in the brainstem. And the notion that Mangan is a brain disease attributed to inherently hyper excitable and hyper responsive neuronal circuits need to be revised as the so called Mangan brain may simply be altered by the ongoing bombardment of its neurons by pain signals that originate in peripheral tissues such as the meninges. The overall conclusion so far is that since CGRP monoclonal antibodies prevent migraine by acting outside the brain, it is reasonable to conclude that the principal driver of the headache phase of migraine is the meningeal receptor. Where are CGRP monoclonal antibodies appear? Well, since they appear in the door, we looked at their possible action on blood vessels in the meninges, dura and pia. As you can see here, CGRP monoclonal antibodies do not prevent CISD-induced vascular response. It's, it is true for the brief dilatation and prolonged constriction of the PL arteries, the prolonged dilatation of the dural arteries, and the brief dilatation of PL veins. CG, CGRP monoclonal antibodies also do not prevent CISD-induced plasma protein exervization. This is what plasma protein exervization looks in real life in response to CSD, and the data on the right showed that presence of fermanezumab produced no prevention or does not play any role in plasma protein exervization. The overall conclusion is therefore that CGRP monoclonal antibodies sites of action in migraine prevention are likely to involve the dura and its vasculature, as well as the sensory and potentially parasympathetic ganglia. It is unlikely that CGRP monoclonal antibodies prevent migraine by acting directly on neurons inside the blood brain barrier. And the last one is that while CGRP play a role in migraine, pathophysiology, migraine is unlikely to be simply a CGRP disorder. So just to leave you with our task and question for the next, the next few years, here's the question. In spite of the fact that all data suggests that CGRP monoclonal antibodies do not cross the blood brain barrier and enter the brain, we just published a paper that showed that in animal injected with CGRP, the, the spreading velocity of cortical spreading depression become much faster, and that the recovery period of cortical neuron decreases significantly. It is shortened. I can talk a lot about how it happened, about what it means. But the question is, how can peripherally acting drug have any effect, direct or indirect, on, co on cortical functioning that is related to migraine, I think will be the next task that will keep us occupied in our attempt to understand mechanism of action and what role it plays in migraine pathophysiology. I'm going to stop here with thanking my colleagues, Augustine Mello, Aaron Shane, Andy Strassman, Rodrigo Noceda, and Saito Shina and Jennifer Stratton. Thank you for your attention. Welcome back. Thank you, Professor Burstein, for being with us. It's a very nice presentation. Actually, I grew up uh, reading the paper by you and your group. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. Just a curiosity, because uh, uh, reading your paper in pain, the last, uh, for, from the last slide you presented, uh, Fremanesumab acted behind the blood-brain barrier because uh, the blood-brain barrier of rats was disrupted, correct? Uh, yep. So, so, so this, I, I think this is a very interesting thing because uh, probably this mitigated the role of CCRP in cortical spreading depression as well. Um, 
So uh, I'm not sure that this is the right direction to go. In the studies on the cortical spending depression, yes, we put electrode inside, but uh, I don't think that it is that the results that we are getting are related to the fact that the, bl that the blood brain barrier is broken enough to allow fermonezumab to get to the cortex because the anatomical studies that we did showed that when we break on purpose the, the blood brain barrier, usually fermonezumab will diffuse about 100 micron from the wall of the blood vessel. It will not reach the entire cortex. Mm. So well, how do we explain it? I think that on the long run, it will be cortical metabolism. It will be that, uh, that this drug have an effect on other systems in the body that eventually translate into changes in long-term changes in cortical metabolism, in, maybe in glucose, maybe in other metabolites that will alter uh, cortical functions. Uh, which is really secondary to the effects in the periphery and not a result of the direct effect because for most cases we do not we do not see fermanezumab anywhere in the central nervous system yes so uh, the question is when you showed the the last slide rami you showed that if i understood correctly that if you administrate fermanezumab you also see some alterations or changes uh, of the cortical spray depression uh, yes. in terms of the in terms of the i don't know maybe a reduced threshold can i say that because you prolong the no. time of no no the only the, the only change that is really significant is the cortical recovery period how long it takes for the cortex to resume normal activity so if you think about migraine so or I right, to get a scotoma. Uh, the scotoma presumably is that when the visual cortex is somewhat more quiet or inhibited, and then you get the flashes of light and the and the and the excitatory part of the cortical of, of aura. I think that the period of neuronal silencing, which is not well understood, we, we really don't understand what is the what govern, what is the molecular mechanism that govern that uh, regulate the silencing period of the cortex after cortical spending depression and what decide when the neuron will resume normal activity. But what we are getting is that the cortical silencing period becomes shorter in two migraine preventive drugs, Botox and Fermanezumab, CGRP monoclonal antibodies. Both drugs don't enter the brain and both do exactly the same thing. It is, it's really, it's the only common things to these two migrant preventive because one of them makes cortical spending depression propagate faster and the other one makes it slower. It can't be the propagation rate that determined the role of a migrant preventive. That was way too simplistic way view to look at how migrant preventative work, that it only changed the propagation rate. It isn't, it's just not good enough. It has to do something that is bigger than that but nevertheless just remember one thing no drug that we test completely eliminate cortical spreading depression cortical spreading depression even a single wave continue to happen regardless of the drug we give it it changes what happened in the cortex after and i think that what we proposed in the paper was that when you shorten the cortical the period it takes for the cortex to recover you minimize the overall impact of the cortex on the activation of the pain fibers Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank Ryan. you. Thank you for being with us. Nice presentation. We move on to the second data blitz. The presenter is uh, Dr. Florian Olden Huvel from uh, Ulm University. He works uh, in the lab of uh, Francesco Roselli and uh, today is going to present data on uh, altered nociception in uh, an uh, Otis model. Please go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my Data Blitz presentation. My name is Florian Oldeheuvel, and I work at the group of Professor Francesco Roselli at Ulm University. I'm happy to show you some of our data about nociceptive dorsal wound circuitry in autism. As you may know, autism spectrum disorder dis show a disruption in nociception. This can be shown by a hyposensitivity or an increased allodynia. Most of the nociceptive 
uh, processing occurs in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. However, not much is known about the nociceptive or somatosensory processing in autism spectrum disorder. Therefore, we have used the Schenk 2 knockout mouse model, which show an autistic like phenotype and have performed behavioral and high resolution microscopic analysis to investigate dorsal horn nociceptive transmission. We have found that the Schenk 2 knockout mice display, display a hypersensitivity to inflammatory pain shown by the increased sensitivity in the formalin test and verified by the cold avoidance test and the adhesive removal test. Our microscopic analysis showed that there are a subset of Schenk 2 high neurons in layer 3, 4 and 5 of the dorsal horn in the mouse and the human spinal cords. Using specific Cree lines for inhibitory and excitatory neurons, we have, we have shown that these Schenk 2 high neurons are a subset of mainly inhibitory glycinergic interneurons. Based on this uh, behavioral analysis, we hypothesized that there might be a disruption in synaptic uh, transmission of on glycinergic interneurons. And indeed, we found that there is a disruption of NMDA receptor clustering and VGLU2 receptor clustering in Schenk 2 knockout mice. This synaptic uh, disruption resulted in a decreased activation of glycinergic interneurons, shown by the CFOS mRNA, decreased CFOS mRNA, and an increased uh, activation of layer two, layer one and two neurons uh, upon a nociceptive stimulus. Which basically means that in the Schenk 2 knockout mouse model, there is a reduced synaptic input upon the inhibitory glycinergic interneurons, which increases the excitation in layer one and two. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions that are there. We are back. Thank you, Florian, for your presentation. Uh, very nice insights on the nociception. Uh, if uh, everything you show was uh, on uh, dorsal root ganglion, uh, I wonder if uh, the, the same mechanism uh, could be uh, hypothesized in the trigeminal ganglion from an anatomical point of view. <clears throat> I'm not sure if this can be completely translated to another area from this point of view, since the circuitry in the dorsal horn is quite, uh, quite complex. We have not performed any of these experiments, so I'm not sure about this, to be honest. Okay, I think it's uh, very nice for the future because uh, if we are able to identify neurons and interneurons involved in nociception, for example, in uh, neuropathic pain, dorsal root, but also for the germinal ganglion for the headache field, will be very important to provide insights uh, for uh, uh, novel target therapies uh, in migraine and not, not only. Okay, thank you again for your data. Thank you very much. Now we move to the last presentation. It's a clinical translational research talk. It's from uh, Noshi Najikani. She is a professor of radiology at uh, Harvard Medical School and the University of Gothenburg. Her uh, research shed light on several anatomical and functional uh, mechanisms in migraine by means of MRI and uh, PET scans. And uh, today uh, she will talk about uh, neuroimaging of aura. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nushin Hajikani. I'm a neuroscientist doing research at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging, Mass Gen Hospital and Harvard in Boston, as well as at the Gilberg Center at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my research at this exciting conference and to thank the audience for taking the time to listen to my presentation. So today, I'm going to present data related to the imaging of neuroinflammation in migraine with aura. I don't have any disclosure. In 30% of cases, migraine is preceded by transient neurological symptoms that we call the aura. 90% of auras are visual, but it's very possible that we are actually missing auras that manifest themselves by more subtle symptoms that affect, for example, higher cognitive functions. In any case, the point is that understanding the mechanisms underlying migraine visual aura 
might cast light on the pathophysiology of migraine and inform about the inflammatory cascade that results in experiencing a migraine headache. One needs to remember that migraine aura typically precedes the headache and that there is therefore a good reason to think that there is a causal role between aura and headache. So we have demonstrated more than 20 years ago that cortical spreading depression, CSD, is the substrate of migraine visual aura with changes in the bold signal that were paralleling the visual experience of the migrainer, starting at the center and slowly progressing towards the periphery at a rate of three to five millimeters per minute. Cortical spreading depression not only can give rise to all kinds of neurological symptoms, but it also activates the trigeminal system and results in meningeal inflammation and pain. So now, how do we connect the CSD and the headache pain? In the next slides, I'm going to show you how the cascade of events go from CSD to meningeal inflammation and pain. So here is a drawing where you can see the cortex represented in blue here. Here you have a neuron, a glial cell, a pile artery, the dura with the meningeal artery inside the dura, and then the bone. So here are the proposed mechanisms of activation of the trigeminal vascular system in migraine following CSD. During CSD, neurons locally release various pro-inflammatory signaling molecules. These molecules induce the synthesis of inflammatory substances, such as prostaglandins and cytokines by glial cells. These inflammatory substances activate the trigeminal receptors that are located in the pia and the pial arteries. And these produce an orthodromic signal that reaches the ganglion of the trigeminal nerve and transmits the nociceptive signal or pain to the nervous, central nervous system. But in addition, there is a CSD-induced antidromical activation of the trigeminal nerve that follows the trigeminal vascular pathway, especially along the middle meningeal artery. This leads to the release of vasoactive pro-inflammatory peptides, including CGRP, in the dura mater. And this produces vasodilation, plasma extravasation, and the local activation of dural mast cells, the latter producing a long-lasting activation and sensitization of dural nociceptors. So pain in migraine comes from the meninges and is experienced because the trigeminal nerve is the sensitive nerve for the dura matter. The trigeminal nerve has fibers around larger vessels, such as the meningeal artery, and also around the smaller vessels that can be found in the pia matter. The trigeminal ganglion contains the body of 20 to 150,000 pseudo-unipolar neurons, which essentially have two axonal branches. One set, the distal one, is the one that will then divide into the three known branches of the trigeminal nerve, 5, 1, 5, 2, and 5, 3. The other set of axons project to the brainstem and the trigeminal nuclei. Conduction in these axons can be both orthodromic and antidromic. In the orthodromic direction, signals from the branches of the trigeminal nerve are sent to the brainstem and play a role in tactile and pain processing. In the antidromic direction, which is induced by CSD, neurons from the trigeminal ganglion that innervates the intracranial vessels release several vasoactive inflammatory neuropeptides that include CGRP, substance P, neurokinin, etc. This results in mast cell degranulation and produces local vascular effects. Note that the trigeminal ganglion is not behind the blood-brain barrier, which is why it can be targeted by, for example, monoclonal antibodies against CGRP. So to repeat one more time how this cascade goes, cortical spreading depression induces the release of pro-inflammatory signaling molecules by the neurons and of inflammatory signaling molecules by the glia. These molecules activate trigeminal receptors located in the pia and the pial arteries. This produces a signal running ortho and antidromically. The orthodromic signal goes to the brainstem and transmits the pain. The antidromic signal follows the trigeminal vascular pathway along the MMA, releases vasoactive pro-inflammatory peptides in the dura matter and in the pia matter. And this produces vasodilation, plasma extravasation, and local activation of dural mast cells. So now I'm going to show you how one can image this neuroinflammation. The translocator protein TSPO is mainly found on the outer membrane of the mitochondria. 
It has been used as a marker of inflammation, both centrally and peripherally, as it becomes upregulated during neuroinflammatory response. Cells that express TSPO increased uptake can be measured with PET using a radio tracer, in our case, carbon 11 PBR28. TSPO uptake increase is upregulated in glial cells during neuroinflammatory states. So here is the first of two studies that I will present to you. This one was published in 2019 in Neurology. In this study, we examined 13 patients who had migraine with aura and compared them with 16 healthy controls using PBR28, the TSPO marker. We looked at the uptake of, of this tracer and also at its relations with clinical variables. Patients in this study had episodic migraine with aura, and they were willing to refrain from taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for the two weeks prior to the scanning so that it would not interfere with the inflammatory cascade. Participants were scanned in the interictal period and required to have had at least one migraine attack with aura during the 15 days before the imaging session. So this slide shows the results of the whole brain voxel-wise analysis. Basically, you can see three groups of areas with increased uptake. One is shown here in green and has somatosensory areas, S1 and S2, as well as the insula. Another group represents visual areas with the primary visual cortex here in blue and extra straight visual areas. And the third group represents a series of frontal and prefrontal areas represented in red. It's interesting to note that while all but two participants had visual auras, some also had somatosensory auras and also described word finding difficulties, which we called relates, for example, to this uptake here in the Broca area. We also found a correlation between migraine frequency and uptake in the primary and secondary sen sensory areas, as well as in the anterior insula. So the main findings of this first study were that we found elevated signal in eclerical migrainers with aura in structures that are involved in pain processing, in CSD generation. I didn't have time to go into details here, but we did find increased uptake in area V3A, which was the source of the CSD in our 2001 paper. Uptake was also increased in areas involved with aura symptoms, visual, somatosensory, and word fin finding difficulties. And notes that the uptake in the prefrontal cortex could be the sign of the presence of silent auras in this part of the brain that is involved in higher cognitive functions. And here is the second study about neuroinflammation that we published in 2020. Basically, it examined the same data set as in the first study, but only included migraineurs who had had at least one episode of migraine with aura during the previous four weeks which resulted in including 11 out of the 13 patients from the first study. We also added a second group of control participants suffering from chronic low back pain in order to evaluate whether the changes we saw were just due to pain or whether they were specific to migraine. But the question you may ask when you see this title is what are paramenanges? Well, this is what we call the paramenanges. It consists of the meninges, which means the dura matter, the arachnoid and the pia matter, and also includes the calvarial bone and its marrow. Note that the meningeal artery is within the dura mater, while the pile artery is run on the surface of the brain within the pile arachnoid, also called the leptomeninges. Here you see PET tracer in four representative patients. Black arrows indicate the primary visual cortex. Red arrows show the location of the meninges, and white arrows show the location of the skull marrow. So in these four individuals, we can clearly see a large uptake in what we just defined as the PMT here. Now, if we look at the group data for the three groups, that's, that is migrainers with aura, chronic low back pain patient, and healthy controls, you can see that only migrainers with aura show this increased uptake in this area that we have just defined as the PMT and that's delineated here in blue. We also wanted to test whether the enhanced signal would be seen specifically within tissue in close contact with where we thought a CSD induced cascade would have happened that is over the occipital cortex. 
And as you can see, only region in direct proximity with the visual cortex where a CSD had happened previously showed increased uptake of the tracer in the migraine patient compared to the two other groups. So migraine with visual aura is associated with a sustained inflammatory signal in the meninges and bone. This is seen in the bone and the meninges that are overlying the visual cortex. It is specific for migraine as it is not present in other pain conditions such as low back pain. And it persists for days. It is, if you want, a historical fingerprint of events during migraine with visual aura. So this brings us to another part of the head that I did not think I would ever have that great interest in, the skull and the bone marrow. As I showed you before, we saw a signal coming from the spongy layer between the inner and the outer skull. The spongy bone contains hematopoietic bone marrow and also inflammatory leukocytes produ production. Very recent fascinating work is being con conducted in this area. And here I show an illustration uh, that I took from a science article published last year by Kugura and colleagues who demonstrated that the skull and the vertebral bone marrow are myelid cell reservoirs for the meninges and the CNS parenchyma. One important thing to note is that the tracer that we use, PBR28, shows cells that express TSPO and that there are many types of cells beyond the microglia that actually express TSPO. And these include macrophages, monocytes, myeloid progenitors, neutrophils, and mast cells. So the meninges participate to the brain neuroinflammatory response. There, is, there are connections between the skull and the meninges that allow immune cells to move between the calvaria marrow and the dura. The bone marrow and the calvaria has immune cells that may be involved in several brain pathologies. And I highly recommend you read this uh, work by Colabas uh, at uh, Isle. Uh, this is uh, published in BioArchive and it has, it's, it's very elegant work. And the next slide ha has an image that I took from this article. And basically what they found was that the bone marrow across the mouse body displays a heterogeneity in their molecular profile, but that the calvaria marrow has cells that have a distinct profile that is relevant to brain pathologies. Brain native proteins have been identified in the calvaria in pathological states. And so TSPO PET imaging of the human skull could be used as a proxy of neuroinflammation in the brain. So what do we know about these channels? After inflammation, such as the case in meningitis or in stroke, myeloid cells travel from the bone marrow towards the meninges in the brain, which is against the usual direction of the flow that typically goes away from the brain. It is not completely clear yet how the bone marrow gets this signal, but it's possible that it is through the upregulation of cytokines and or of high mobility group box protein one, which is an alarmant that is released from neurons during CSD and stroke. The signal could also come from the pro-inflammatory neuropeptides that are released by the trigeminovascular axons that pass through the calvarium from the meninges. Sustained signal in the calvarium may serve as a local repository of inflammation, and it may also trigger subsequent attacks or promote migraine chronification. Note that the glymphatic network may also be involved in this process, and recent research from Mike Moskowitz's group in rodents indicates that submillimeter skull channels do transport CSF from the subarachnoid space into the cranial bone marrow. So in summary, this human study provides the first evidence for a robust and persistent inflammatory signal within the PMT, that is meninges and bone marrow, overlying cortical areas generating migraine visual aura. These results in humans are compatible with conclusions from numerous animal model studies linking inflammation to cortical spreading depression. This also may explain some of the symptoms related to meningeal irritation that are present uh, in a migraine attack, such as photophobia. What are the future directions from this work? First, it's important to understand what happens in those who only suffer from migraine without aura. Second, it would be great if we could be more specific with our tracer and only tag, for example, uh, activated macrophages. 
Another question is uh, related to the relationship between these inflammatory markers and blood inflammatory markers. We also need to understand the role that this inflammation plays in chronification of migraine. And finally, our findings raise important questions about the impact and consequences of an upregulated inflammatory signal in calvarium bone. We suggest that newly explored bridging vessels provide the conduits for possible signal migration from the brain with implication for migraine pathophysiology, as well as for the pathophysiology of other neuroinflammatory disorders, that is head trauma, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and maybe even COVID-19. So the take-home message of all this is, CSD, the pathophysiological substrate of migraine aura, is the first step of a cascade of events that leads to neuroinflammation. We probably underestimate the prevalence of migraine aura. We can observe neuroinflammation in the brain and in the meninges and in the bone marrow in migraine with aura. And future studies with, will help understand the role of these newly found connections between the calvarial bone marrow, the meninges, and the brain. And finally, I want to thank uh, all my collaborators with whom I've worked for more than 20 years for some of them, like Moskowitz, a wonderful mentor. And uh, I also want to thank the funding agencies and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ajikali, for your presentation. A very nice uh, overview and novel uh, uh, way of looking uh, of uh, aura in the migraine. Uh, just one brief question from the audience, that is, uh, if uh, there are any associated interleukins with migraine, and uh, I would say if you plan to perform a biochemical uh, assays in patients with inflammation of uh, the paramedics. So, yeah, I, it's a very interesting question, and we are now collecting uh, blood markers of inflammation to, to connect that with the PBR uptake as well, but I don't have the answer to that question yet. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, so I have a question. Uh, in 2009, we showed in JCN that uh, meningitis receptors with parent axons in the dura uh, send collateral branches to the bone marrow in the calvaria and make contact with, uh, with uh, inflammatory and immune cells in the bone marrow, uh, suggesting that that uh, whatever activate these cells in the bone marrow can be sufficient to trigger activation of the pain fibers. Uh, so the question they're asking is, does it have to be that these cells have to migrate into the dura or into the, toward the brain, or can they activate the pain fibers simply in the bone marrow? That's a very good question. And of course, I, I, I don't know how I would be able to, to answer that question in the, in the human, but it's definitely some, it could be both, it could be a combination, and uh, it would be really interesting to imagine what kind of experiment could be done to separate these two uh, possible uh, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So I see the, the question here, uh, Roberto, is about uh, of whether the chronic migraine can predict dementia and any cause in the future. Uh, I just wanna say definitely no, that there is no such, uh, I would say, uh, relationship. So if you are a migrainer, uh, there is no risk of developing of uh, dementia. There are, of, of course, other risk factors, but migraine is not a risk factor for dementia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, another thing, uh, I was attracted by the presence of uh, mast cells, uh, of course, in the paramenindis. And uh, it was demonstrated that histamine was increasing in migraine patients. And uh, also, Prof. Olesen showed that histamine infusion was able to induce uh, migraine in migraine patients. Uh, do you believe that uh, this may represent a pivotal cell for the paramenings uh, paramenings uh, entity and have a main role or just part of this novel entity? I I don't have an answer to that, but that's why I would like to have a better tracer that would tag this one type of cell because then we would know better exactly what's the role of, of the mast cells uh, in the big realm of, of all these PBR uh, uh, responding cells. But yeah, it's, it's a very important question. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we can move to the final part of this session. 
I want to thank all the speakers and uh, I leave the floor to my co-chair, Professor Ashina, for the closing remarks. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Thank you for chairing this uh, meeting. And uh, I think that uh, the, the, this uh, event was very successful. I, I found out that we had about uh, 320 participants attending this important session. Headache and pain is an important part of neurology. And we are so happy that so many people attended. So thank you very much for all participants. Thank you for our distinguished speakers and young scientists and the future brain prize, Nobel prize winners. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you.